This is the 24th video in a series devoted to introductory proof writing. And today we're gonna to look at a very powerful way to show that two sets have the same cardinality. But we need a bit of a setup first. So let's recall if we have sets A and B, we say the cardinality of A is less than or equal to the cardinality of B, if and only if there is an injective map from A to B. So I'll use this hook arrow to mean that we have an injection from A to B. Furthermore, we would say that cardinality of B is less than or equal to cardinality of A, if and only if there was an injection from B to A. And so we know with numbers, if x is less than or equal to y and y is less than or equal to x, then x must be equal to y. So it would be nice if that were also true for cardinality. So in other words, it would be nice if the cardinality of a being less than or equal to the cardinality of b and the cardinality of B is less than or equal to the cardinality of A, then they have equal cardinality. In other words, A and B are equinumerous. But what does that really mean? That means we should be able to take an injection from A to B and another injection from B to A and construct a bijection from A to B. And that's exactly what we'll do today. And this is called the Schroeder-Bernstein theorem or sometimes the Schroeder-Cantor-Bernstein theorem. Okay, so let's give a general idea of the construction before we look at the careful proof. So let's say this blue box over here is our set A and it's being mapped to this red circle over here by our function f, and that is our set b. So notice all we have is that a gets mapped to b in a one-to-one -one method, so it's injective. So that means we may miss elements of b over here. So we could maybe see the image of a inside of b like this. So this inside square right here would be f of a. Okay, nice. Then we could take the image of b inside of a under g and get a picture that's something like this. So we would have a circle in here. So remember that g is injective, it may be surjective, so it may miss things like this right here. But notice it's got this f of a inside of it. So let's draw this f of a inside right here. And let's get a handle on what these parts are. So notice that this outside bit right here is g of b. And then this inside bit right here is g of f of a. And then the idea is we keep doing this to build like this nested action. So let's maybe do one more. So applying F, that'll actually give you a copy of another red circle in here and another blue circle in here or blue square in here. And what would those be? So this would be F of G of B and this right here would be f of g of f of a. And you can imagine this going on forever and ever and ever and ever and ever. Now, what we'd like to do is somehow define this map from a to b so that it makes a choice as to which part of this like descending inclusion we are a part of. And maybe the easiest way to do that is to map all of the blue sets over here on the left to the blue sets on the right, and then map all of the red sets on the left to the red sets on the right. So let's just keep in mind that the blue set will be between this outer blue boundary and this red boundary. So this blue set that I'm shading right here should get mapped to this blue set over here that I'm shading. So for instance, a point right here would get mapped to a point right here. Okay, great. And then this red set right here should get mapped from this red set which is right here. And you can imagine what's going on after that. So this blue square that's inside here should get mapped to this blue square inside here. 
And then what's going on here inside of this red circle, but outside of the blue square, will get mapped to a red circle that's inside this inner blue square. Okay, so anyway, what we'd like to do is somehow describe all of the blue sets and all of the red sets. But notice that the red sets are just a complement of the blue sets, so that shouldn't be too hard once we get the blues. Let's notice that this outer blue set is just simply A minus G of B. Great. So that's this outer blue set. Okay, but then what's this inner blue set? Keeping in mind that we'll have this red circle inside, and then what we get after doing this shading. So this blue set in here will be, let's see, G of F of A minus another G of B, because I, we have to take away what's going on right here, but what's going on right here is G of F of G of B. So let's write this down, G of F of G of B. Great. So just to reiterate, this is the outermost blue shading, and then this is the second level of blue shading. But of course we wanna union them. And then we'll get another level of blue shading which is inside of here, and that'll be constructed the same way, but we'll just have more compositions of this uh, G of F of B. So let's see. Putting this all together, we'll get a set which I'll call U, which will be the union as N goes from zero to infinity of the infold composition of G composed with F evaluated at A minus G of B. Okay, and notice that if we set n equal to zero, we get this first set, which like I said, is this outer blue region. If we set n equal to one, we get this set here, which is maybe the next level of blue region, and then so on and so forth. Okay, so just to reiterate, those are all of the blue sets. And then after that, we'll have all of the red sets are just simply their um, complement in A. So they'll be A minus U. Then we can figure out what happens to the elements by what we spoke about before. So this element right here, which I'll maybe call A, will get mapped to F of A. Okay, but then this element right here, which maybe we'll call X, will get mapped over here to the inverse image of X under G. But notice since G is injective, that's well-defined, especially since X is inside the image of G in the first place. Okay, so it looks like when we're in a blue set, in other words, when we're in the set U, we will be traveling over to our set B using our function F, whereas if we're in a red set, and the red sets are labeled by V, we will be traveling from A to B with the inverse of G, which is well-defined because we are inside the image of G, and G is injective. Okay, so now that we've got this kind of idea of what's going on here, let's look at the careful proof. Now we're ready to prove the main result for this video, which is, like I said, the Cantor-Schroeder-Bernstein theorem, which says if the cardinality of A is less than or equal to the cardinality of B, and the cardinality of B is less than or equal to the cardinality of A, then they have equal cardinalities. Okay, so let's do that. So let's suppose that we have our setup. So cardinality of A is less than or equal to cardinality of B. And let's say that is via an injection, which I'll call F. So I'll use this hook arrow to indicate that it's an injection. And then we'll also suppose that cardinality of B is less than or equal to cardinality of A, and that's via an injection which I'll call B, or G. And now we'll define those sets, which will be the blue and red sets that we saw on the previous board while we were getting some motivation for what's going on. So let's define our set U, which will be the union over all non-negative integers of the infold composition of G composed with F, and then evaluated at the set A minus G of the image of B. So something like that. 
And then we'll take v to be equal to a minus u. But that clearly sets up a disjoint union of a. So a is the disjoint union of u with v. And that's because v is defined to be the complement of u in a. Okay, now we have our sets defined. Now let's define our function. So we'll define our function h from a to b by h of x equals, so it'll be equal to f of x if x is in u, and it'll be equal to g inverse of x if x is in v. And maybe let's underscore that this is okay, and what I mean by okay, it's well defined, because um, x is in the image of g, so that means we can apply g inverse, and g is one to one. That means there's a clear single element for which this is. Okay. So now we'd like to show that H is one-to-one -one and onto. So let's first show that H is injective. Okay, so let's suppose that H of X equals H of Y. And this is gonna break down into three cases depending on where X and Y come from. So the first case is if X and Y are both from U. Okay, but h of x equals h of y when they both come from u boils down to f of x equals f of y, which boils down to x equals y, and that's because f itself is injective. So there's not much to do right there. Now the second case will be what happens if they both come from v. Okay, well, if they both come from V, then applying H is the same thing as applying G inverse, and we have G inverse of X equals G inverse of Y. But from here, we'll simply apply G to both sides of this equation, giving us X equals Y. So we don't actually use the injectivity of y at this step, or of g at this step. What we've really done is use the injectivity of g way back here to have this function be well-defined in the first place. Okay, so that brings us to our third case, which is what happens if x is in u and y is in v. So they come from different sets. Okay, well, that means that f of x equals g inverse of y, but now applying g to both sides, we'll get y equals g of f of x. But notice everything of the form g of f of x is inside of u by the definition of u. So this is in u. But let's notice that's a contradiction because we have simultaneously y is in v and y is in u, but those are disjoint sets, so that's impossible. So like I said, that gives us a contradiction. So based on the analysis of these three cases, H must be injective. Now let's move on to the surjectivity proof. We just finished showing that H is one-to-one. -one. In other words, H is injective. Now we'll show it's surjective. But then we'll have a bijection from A to B, which means the cardinality of A will be equal to the cardinality of B, finishing everything off. Okay, so let's suppose we have something from the codomain. I'll call it little b. So like I said, that comes from capital B. But notice that means that g of little b must be inside of a, given the fact that g goes from b to a. But then let's recall that a is the disjoint union of u and v. So I'll put a little dot right there to show that we're, or to indicate that we have a disjoint union. So that little dot sometimes means that u intersect v is the empty set. Again, a disjoint union. But the fact that we have a disjoint union there allows us to break ourselves into two cases. So the first case is what happens if G of B is inside of U. Okay, but that means that G of B is inside of one of the components that union up to U. So in other words, it's inside G of F composed with itself n times, evaluated at a minus g of b, 
for some n bigger than or equal to zero. So in other words, g of b equals g composed with f, composed with itself n times, evaluated at x, for some x, which is inside of a, minus g of b. And now I'd like to make a little subclaim over here that n is not allowed to be zero. So here's my subclaim that n is not allowed to be zero. Because if n is equal to zero, then that means g of b equals x. But notice that x is not inside of g of b by our assumption up here, but that's a clear contradiction because if you evaluate an element at a function, well, it will be in the image of that function. So that means that in fact, yes, n cannot be zero, it has to be bigger than or equal to one. But if it's bigger than or equal to one, we can factor a copy of g composed with f off of it. So we have g composed with f composed with g composed with f to the n minus one evaluated at x. But now we can cancel a g from both sides and we will have b equals f of g composed with f n minus one of x. Great. But now if we set this element right here equal to a, then what we have is b equals f of a for some a in a. It just turns out that the a has this complicated formula right here, which we got out of our argument above. Okay, so like I said, that's our first case when g of b is in u. Now let's look at the second, somewhat shorter case when g of b is in v. Now let's look at this second case where g of b is in v. But notice if g of b is in v, then applying h is the same thing as applying g inverse by our definition of h. So let's note that real quick. And then this is gonna fall out very quickly. So h of g of b is exactly equal to g inverse of of g of b, which is equal to b. So there, we found a pre-image g of little b of our element b that we chose above, but that's exactly what we needed to do to finish this surjectivity proof. Okay, so that finishes the proof of this big theorem, and now we'll look at some example applications. So we just finished proving the Cantor-Schroeder-Bernstein theorem, which says that if you have cardinality of A is less than or equal to cardinality of B, and cardinality of B is less than or equal to cardinality of A, then the two cardinalities are equal. But in terms of functions, that means if we have an injection from A to B and an injection from B to A, then we have a bijection between these two sets. And that's maybe how you want to think about it because often it's most easy to find an injection between two sets and then not worry about finding a surjection. So like I said, injections are somewhat easier to construct than surjective maps. And so this cantor schroeder bernstein theorem allows us to show two sets have equal cardinality, they're e equinumerous, by just constructing injections, which, like I said, are easier to construct. Okay, so let's do an example that we have done before, and that is to show that the closed interval 0, 1 has equal cardinality with the open interval 0, 1. Okay. So let's first show that we have the inequality maybe in this direction. Open interval 0, 1 is less than or equal to in cardinality to closed interval 0, 1. And since open interval 0, 1 is a subset of closed interval 0, 1, this is quite easy. We can just use the inclusion map, which is generally written as an I, and this takes like I said, open interval 0, 1 to closed interval 0, 1, and just it takes x to x. So this is clearly an injective map, but it being an injective map proves this cardinality condition. Okay, so now let's prove this second direction so that the cardinality of 0, 1 is less than or equal to the cardinality of open 0, 1. And maybe let's visualize what's going on with this over here. Okay, 
So let's look at open interval zero to one on the bottom, and we'll look at closed interval zero to one above. And what we'll essentially just do is we'll scale this closed interval zero one until it fits inside of the open interval zero one. So let's scale it maybe until it moves between one quarter and three quarters. And that is most definitely not on to, but this example is not on to either, but it is definitely one to one. If all we do is scale this a little bit. So now we've got to construct a function that does that, but that's not too difficult. So let's define F from closed zero one into open zero one by F of X equals, let's maybe take it equal to one quarter plus one half times x, and that'll do it exactly. So let's notice that takes the point zero to one quarter, one to three quarters, and then scales everything in between. And that's clearly a one to one function, which I'll let you check. Okay, so now putting these two things together, we have our result up here that these two have equal cardinality. All right, let's now look at a little bit more of an interesting example. For our last result, we'll show that the cardinality of the real numbers is equal to the cardinality of the power set of the natural numbers. So we alluded to this result, I think, in the last video. Now we'll prove it. And we'll use the fact that the cardinality of the real numbers is the same as the cardinality of the half open interval from 0 to 1, where we include 0. And we'll do this by constructing injections. So an injection which I'll call f from 0, 1 to the power set, and then another injection which I'll call g from the power set to 0, 1. Okay, so let's see how we can construct f first. So the idea is to take an element from 0, 1 and then, writing, and then write it in its decimal expansion. So let's do that. So let's take x from 0 to 1 and, like I said, write it in its decimal expansion. So it can be written as 0.a1, a2, a3, a4, so on and so forth. So we have x is equal to that. And you might say, well, decimal expansion is non-unique. A trailing tail of nines is the same thing as a trailing tail of zeros. But let's just always take a trailing tail of zeros instead of a tailing trail of nines. So I'll maybe point that here. So we'll use 0 0.4 instead of 0 0.399 repeating. Great. So when we have a choice as to take a trailing nines or trailing zeros, we'll take just the trailing zeros. Okay, now we'll define f evaluated at x as follows. So it'll be equal to 10 times a1 and then 100 times a2 and then 1000 times a3 all the way up 10 to the n times a sub n and so on and so forth. So let's look at a little a bit of an example of what's going on here. So f evaluated at 0.231 will be equal to the subset 2300 1000. And recall we're getting subsets as outputs of f because f should take these numbers and output subsets. So that's the right type here. And now we just need to finish this off with the claim that f is injective. But this is pretty straightforward. Let's suppose that f of 0.a1, a2, so on and so forth is equal to f of 0.b1, b2, so on and so forth. But let's notice that this encodes the decimal points as like multiples of powers of 10. So it's really easy to see when two sets are equal. And in fact, what this means is that 10 to the n times a sub n is equal to 10 to the n times b sub n for all n. But that gives us that a sub n is equal to b sub n for all n. But that means that those two inputs were the same. So maybe if we call this input here x and this input here y, then that implies that x equals y. But that's what we need for our injectivity.
Okay, so now let's construct our reverse map. Now let's construct our map G, which takes an element from a power set, in other words, a subset of natural numbers, and it gives us a number between zero and one. And this will kind of be in the same spirit. So let's say that G takes a subset A, and what it gives us is the number 0.A1, A2, A3, A4, so on and so forth, where we define A sub N to be zero if N is not in A, and it's one if N is in A. So somehow we're like collecting some data on what natural numbers are inside of A. So let's look at some examples here. So let's notice that G of the empty set is equal to just the number zero. That's because nothing is in the empty set. And then what about G of the set of all natural numbers? That's a subset. So we have to know what G does to that as well. Well, that will be equal to 0 0.1111, so on and so forth. That is a repeating one. It's, that's because it includes all natural numbers. Let's look at a little different example. Let's say G evaluated at the set 1, 3, 4. So that'll be 0 0.1011. So it contains 0, does not contain 2, contains 3, contains 4, doesn't contain anything else. So that would be the image of G in this case. Okay, so now let's finish this off by proving that G is injective. And by the construction of G, this will be pretty straightforward. So let's suppose that G of A equals G of B. But then we need to show that A is equal to B. But A and B are subsets, so we need to do that with subset double inclusion. So let's suppose that little n is within A. Okay. But what that tells us is that G of A, if we set it equal to 0.A1, A2, AN, so on and so forth, this nth digit right here is equal to one. But then if we set G of B equal to the expansion 0.B1, B2 up to BN, so on and so forth, then this nth digit right here is also one. That's because these outputs are the same. But if the nth digit of B is one, that tells us that N is in fact inside of B as well. But that means that A is a subset of B. But then by a completely symmetric argument, we can show that B is a subset of A, so I won't write that down because it's completely symmetric. So in the end, we will have that A and B are equal as sets, which is what we need for G to be injective. And that finishes the proof of these equal cardinalities. Now let's finish this off with some warm-up exercises. So I've got two warm-up exercises for you. The first is to show that if A is a subset of B and we have an injection from B to A, which we'll call G, then A and B have equal cardinalities. Then next, let's prove that N cross N, in other words, N squared, has equal cardinality with N using Cantor, Schroeder, Bernstein. So we did an alternative proof last time, but I think you could do a second kind of nice proof as well using this new theorem, and that would give you practice using this new theorem. And that's a good place to stop.